Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Thursday. Um, I'm seeing you from Stella Cantwell's house. We're in Bulgaria. So it's pretty wonderful to be actually in her studio. And today we have Carolyn Devil, and she's going to be showing sticks and also watercolor ground. And I'm so appreciative, Carolyn, of you, of you doing that. Um, I'm finally feeling what it's like for people who uh, live in other parts <laughs> of the world to be up so late. <laughs> yes. So I'm looking forward to uh, showing. So uh, if I lose connection, I'm going to apologize. It's uh, my connection is kind of spotty. Um, but just proceed without me if, if you lose me. Otherwise, I'm really looking forward to kind of what you're going to show us. Fantastic. I'm really excited to show you. I've got lots set up. You know what I do. I just pull out lots yeah. and lots of stuff for you all to show off lots of nice things. So I had a, a big think about where do I use luminescence? Where do I use grounds? And because I teach, often it's just more sample stuff and it's ideas. Um, and occasionally I take those ideas and make them into some really nice, lovely big works that become a part of either big workshops or a part of my demonstrating um, in different locations. And then they even sometimes get into an exhibition. So it's pretty cool. Awesome. But I've prepared all sorts of bits and pieces for you today. And I thought okay. I'll take you on a journey perhaps around the room and show you a whole lot of ideas because I have been given so many amazing colors that I've been stuck in a color story and not painting as many paintings because I've just been playing with colors. And I find as an artist, the best way to get to understand your art is literally to play with the color. You get to understand, um, I suppose, how they work, how they behave, what color they dry to, the difference of the tube um, versus the pans versus the sticks and all those sort of lovely, beautiful, nice things. So. How about I take you on a little tour of what I've um, set up and then we'll do some little bit of play and practice. Um, so um, I noticed that one of the things that you did was to put me um, on the live and the show this artwork was to put me um, on the live and the show this artwork was to I'm hearing a repeat of my voice. Is that normal or is that just me? It's gone now, so it's you're okay now. Fantastic. So this is the artwork that you put up on the um, on the um, Instagram, and the artwork is actually painted onto one of the what we say a cradled board. Yes. And it's watercolor, of course, but it's then finished in a polyurethane pour. So it has like 70 layers of a liquid, um, I suppose, acrylic surface. It's, it's like, it looks like glass, but it's actually a poured um, polyurethane. And wow. um, I've done that on a whole series of works. These are actually from my exhibition that I had recently. This particular one I love so much because it's all the Queens. Oh. And it's also wow. being completely painted in just watercolor sticks. So wow. you can actually see some of the raw drawing with the sticks in the textures and other parts have been done with the brush. And it just is, just comes alive. And with all the queens, you get all these gorgeous, gorgeous depth of colors and softness of colors. And of course I had to put Australian birds in there. <laughs> <laughs> They're our black cockatoos. They're very famous in Australia. And because I'm a rock artist, you know, I paint rocks in every different possible way. So this is my interesting um, rock pools with floating sticks. And I sort of really enjoyed painting this whole series. There's a whole bunch more in the series, but most of them got sold. So I can't show you a whole lot of my work, which is good as an artist, but it's still sad to see your artworks go and disappear. Caroline, but Caroline. 
Caroline, yes. this, uh, just a question. Does your your uh, layer of polyurethane that do you pay, uh, put it on top of your yes. finished painting? At yes. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. And Is so, Caroline, on top of that, once you put it on, have you ever found that it will re-wet your watercolor? No, I usually give it a really light spray of a matte varnish just in case. And then I put the pour over that okay. light spray. And then there's no risk of it actually diluting the, uh, the watercolor and having it run. And that helps support that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So Fantastic. Well, you've got to put your watercolor behind glass or something. Otherwise it's porous and, and exposed to elements and it can mold and all sorts of things. So this is a great way of um, putting it in there. But anyway, I like I said, I've been on a I've been on a um, a play with color journey. So trying to understand what happens with luminescence and the duochromes and things like that, painting it onto sample cards using the black ground. You can see I've just got plain black ground on some of the card, and actually looking at how that one color looks when it's painted on white versus when it's painted on black. And it's so different, especially, of course, the durochromes are so different. And it helps you to have sample cards like this to select colors in your painting. So even though you may not put one of the duochromes on a black background, you might put it on a dark area and suddenly the colors changed a lot. Whereas things like the iridescence, they're more similar. The interference is different, but the iridescence are only a little bit lighter, yeah. but still a little bit different. So having these cards is so important to understanding um, how the different um, colors behave and how the light is picked up um, from all the mica and things like that in there. Um, so I've been having fun with these wonderful Indian stamps too of late. I'll show you some, some pieces that I've been doing with those. Um, but my journey um, of selecting my favorite 18 colors was so difficult. And a part of that selecting the colors was to see what colors make other colors and what kind of variety I could get from the combination that I put together. So in doing so, I actually then started creating a selection of a color. So the Quinn is the base color here. And then every one of these colors is the mixture of the base color and the combination of colors. So it shows me with my Quinn Coral, if I was to mix those other colors, what combinations I could get. And I've done that right across with many, many colors to try and help me understand the benefits of the color choices that I made. Um, so that's, that was a really good journey. Really, really, really exciting journey. But also when I was choosing my colors, because I love watercolor sticks, can you see what I did, John? Yeah. I cut up your Very. brochure and I stuck it on my <laughs> on my uh, my packaging because now good. I know oh, what belongs where. From where. They're from the color chart. Ah, uh, from the wow. color chart. <laughs> so I think that. I think we all need a color chart that stickers that fit on these. Mm -hmm. What do you think? That's well, really what cool. a good I'm, idea. I'm head of sales know that. <laughs> Okay, that's that's my request to my order that you make the color chart a sticker chart, and we can stick it on our on our sticks packaging, and then we don't get confused because when the paper's going to be worn off or all dirty, we won't know what sticks what. That's, that's clever. Exactly what Ian was asking about, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So this was this is my my contribution to making my sticks function and work. So what I've done in these particular packages is I looked at my colors, my dot cards, and I, and I created myself a little set of travel sticks with, from my dot cards. So I'm trying to predominantly use my colors at the moment so I get more and more familiar with the mixes and the, and the, the, the benefits of those particular colors I chose because really I like all 200 and something colors. It's not just 18 but I'm trying to limit myself to um, painting with my set of colors. It's not just 18, but I'm trying to limit myself to um, 
painting with my set of colours. It's not just 18, but I'm trying to limit my... So these are my sticks so that I can um, understand what colours I've got because in a package, it's very hard to tell what you have and what you're painting with. Whereas if you have a, um, a card made up for yourself, you know what colours you've got there and you know what you're choosing from. And then playing around with the sticks, making miniature works of art. Does everybody recognise this one? It's Matisse's um, cat. It's actually his um, in uh, interior with dog, but I reckon it looked like a cat. That's and nice. actually using the sticks to create these cute little um, pictures. I do this sort of thing with my students, get them to choose a famous artwork and look at different mediums. And from that medium, we look at how we would recreate the same picture in watercolor. So for example, this is an oil painting. And this is one of my sample cards for my students. And I say, okay, how will we recreate that oil painting with watercolor? Wow. So it's sort of really, really rethinking the whole process of how oil painters paint versus how watercolorists paint. And it encourages the students to actually get involved in looking into the depth of what layer goes where um, how to protect or how to create those luminous edges, those, you know, the bright um, coral, queen coral edges on the flowers and things like that. And also then how to finish the work like this artist did with the white wash. So we've actually used a white gouache as the white wash into the watercolour painting. Um, so it's just a learning journey. It's not about um, your finished work. It's just about your process work and understanding that sort of thing. I might have showed you this little package last time I was on, but um, every time I get a new colour, I create a swatch okay. in the Daniel Smith and I actually put all the information from the, from the cards on there and then I've got a larger swatch to put together a combination. So if I'm creating an artwork, I can se select a few of these and I can work out what's gonna work out and what's gonna to go together. And so they're nice big swatches and I've just got them on a little swing, little, little swing thing. Um, so that I can, please. Sorry, darling. How do you connect them to the swing, please? I've put a hole. I've got a little bit of um, plastic at the top so they don't tear and break. And I've just got, it's like a, cow, a shower curtain ring. And that little ring comes undone and I can, it unclips and I can un unclip it and slide more colors onto it. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a great thing to have. It's a great tool and it's a great thing for when you're trying to make color selections on your artwork to have a larger swatch that you can take off and take over to your artwork and put it near it and go, yeah, I like that color, it's gonna work or no, I need to change it to a different color and you can select colors really well from the larger swatch. Um, so of course, what artist doesn't have a color wheel? So this is my color wheel with my dot cards. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, so obviously I haven't put all the toning colors in there. So on the back, woohoo, I have. Yeah the colors that I have added to my dot card that aren't what I call color, they're actually called effects or toners. So lunar black, hematite, genuine, neutral tint, and the duo lapis sunlight. And I've actually dragged the duo lapis sunlight right through that so you could see it on all the darks. But so I have my own personalized color chart I've made. Um, so we're talking about the ground and the very first main painting series I did in the ground was this series of poppies. I'm worried that lights, the, my shadow is getting in the way. So if I put this up, you might be able to see how this painting glows wow. because I've used gold ground Do we see that? as a really major part of the painting. So it's a beautiful, beautiful combination, the gold and the watercolour. 
and the, the painting comes to life and if it gets in the right light it sparkles so it's really really interesting to use the ground as actually a part of your painting and not just as an under piece um, from there I went into a series we had a play with the Toulouse Lautrec style using the ground as a background and so those pictures also have that quality of glowing with the pearl of the gold ground um, and that was a fun that was a workshop I did and a fun series of uh, playing with Toulouse Lautrec's um, girls and I'm not really a portrait artist, so I do challenge a little bit when it comes to portrait to work. Um, but taking the idea of the luminescence and the mica paints, the foils and things like that, I find painting interesting things and then adding the glowing touches of the beautiful gold paints to it actually it brings the whole layer of life to your artwork um, so I've done that for a long time without realizing that I'm quite attracted to things that glow and sparkle <laughs> um, so um, recently in my studio because of my celebration of having my own dot cards I've been getting my students to create a journal of discovery using my palette. So this is my journal I've been working with, along with them. So I've made a journal and so they're all my colors. And then from the colors, it's actually doing sampling. So actually looking at, you know, sort of cascade green and lapis sunlight, and then looking at a picture that you can do with just those two colors. And they're just mini artworks. They're just sample books. This one has a bigger group and then looking at using that wonderful duo lapis sunlight as a effect in the work linked to the lunar black, which has got those wonderful granulating qualities. Um, using the duo lapis sunlight, I don't know if you can pick up the sparkle um, of the ocean, of the water on the beach and actually using it as a part of the effect of, you know, bringing water into your painting. The lunar blacks and all their wonderful things. Mixing two different um, um, colours from my palette, the lavender and the French ultramarine, to try and actually make interesting colours and depth in your skies instead of just one colour. Making fire, of course, making loud and bright things. Uh, making dark water. Um, so that's got quite a big combination of colours to make dark water. Isn't that lunar black amazing? Yeah. Some of the things it does, look at that effect that you can get from lunar black. So the doing this sort of workshop with my students, it encourages them to stop worrying about producing a perfect piece of art, but encourages them just to play and discover and to take that journey of how the paint is going to behave, how the pigments behave, how they work together, which is heavy, which is light. And the only way you can do that is by playing with them. And if you sort of put your mind that you've got to paint this amazing piece of, a piece of art every time, you stop doing the play, playful stuff. Whereas actually just doing little test size and sampling encourages you to actually take the time to play which is all really nice. Looking at um, landscapes with um, warm, um, I think it's queen coral backgrounds versus a more traditional blue sky and how a landscape can be so exciting when it has bright colors. I had to do an Australian landscape with the indigenous flag colors, of course, because that's important in Australia to recognize our wonderful indigenous culture that is a part of our land. Also showing them things like putting too many colours in a painting and how it can be really, really distractive because a lot of people want to, oh, I love this colour, I love that colour, and they go more and more and more into the painting with more and more colours and suddenly they've just got a mess. They've just got too much going on and it's too busy and you can't enjoy it. 
And guess whose work this was inspired by? Nicholas. Of course. Don't we love <laughs> Nicholas's work? Oh, he's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, I, I've loved Nick, Nicholas's work for years. So playing around with how Nicholas plays with his, his beautiful um, Luna Blacks um, and getting all those lovely qualities, you've got to do a sample of, of, of a Nicholas style, which is very, very exciting. Um, playing with um, moving um, the luminescent um, style um, pigments with just seeing things like neutral tints. I've actually got neutral tints. And I've got some Luna Black. And I've got, I think it is the one of the um, green iridescence that is looking gold in this picture. But as it comes over the black, it turns into the green. This is my stamps. So you can see, you can see the stamping, stamping into the picture versus using a leaf. So using a leaf as a stamp into the picture and actually looking at um, nature versus uh, man-made and how the two different um, leaves can, um, I suppose they're both interesting, but the nature one gives you a more natural, true effect versus the stamped one. So showing students how to do those sort of things is always, lots of fun and a, and a real eye opening to how to sort of bring other different interesting things into their work. Um, but again, I went right through playing with different effects, different techniques. And I think that's all in that book. <laughs> we've, only, we've only had two classes of it so far. So that's two lots of classes in that book. Um, so the other thing that I have enjoyed playing with the um, luminescence is creating things like curtains. So the sheer effect over your painting to create things like a curtain. And of course, um, is it Andrew Wy Wy Wyeth that is the most amazing American watercolorist that these particular images were inspired from? Really nice. Uh, so who does, who paints the paintings upside down? Anybody? So this painting, you actually paint this way. And so when you're pouring the water down to make the cloud, it's going in the direction of the bottom because of gravity. And once you've got the beautiful, fantastic background, then you turn it up the right way and paint the vessels. <laughs> Very clever. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a good fun little technique that, that, that we often play with. Um, so doing different workshops in different types and styles, what I encourage artists or new artists to watercolor to do is to play and play and play with all different styles till they find their happy place. Because we're all very different in our art form and all very different how we, um, what inspires us, the brush stroke that we make a bit like our hand, um, our hand work. And it really, um, I suppose, is the best way to discover by trialing lots and lots of styles and then you find your own style amongst that. So predominantly a lot of my classes, that's what we do, trial different styles. This idea of bugs with luminescence, this has just been a fun play thing I've been doing to understand how these beautiful luminescence work and how they glow on the page. And of course, what in nature has luminescence? It's beetles. Very, very, very exciting colors and all sorts of different things. Um, the other thing that I get asked a lot about is people that want to use their art to create fabric or wallpapers. And they talk about how do you make a sample? How do you do this? How do you do that? So I like to sort of have things that are reminiscent of like a interior designer sample book in my folio. So I can show them the sorts of things they could do to bring ideas for their, their fabric making. 
um, and use watercolours as a part of the journey um, of that next stage that they'll take it into a commercial production of their artwork. And watercolour is so inviting to do that kind of production work from. So this, of course, has got foils. It's got the um, luminescence and pearl paints. It's got lots and lots of beautiful things that actually makes a sample. So um, I did prepare these. The idea that I would create a sample page, I would create colours on it is basically I want to set it up to show you just that basis of using the watercolour ground as a part of your learning journey. You don't have to put it onto fancy canvases or onto board and things like that. You can simply just put it on your paper and you can leave texture in your work or you can, you know, nice and matte and black. So you've actually got the black surface that you can test colours on, but actually setting yourself up to have papers ready to test different colours and things like that. So um, there's so many things I constantly always want to show you. Um, I think there's one more over here that I can show you, which is the watercolour ground. This was a piece I've just come out of an exhibition and these wonderful cradled boards, you've probably all seen them in your art stores, they're just the cradled board. And doing a watercolour painting on a surface that you have um, put the watercolour ground on. And then I seal mine with a wax varnish so that they're nice and matte, they're not over glossy, unlike the polyurethane ones. So it's nice and soft, the, um, the finish on that one. This is fun. This one's only part way, part way there. Big ideas and don't know where to go um, next. So it's an artwork in development. And the other thing that I've, yeah. Stephanie uh, just wanted to read a couple of comments uh, from Facebook. Please. Stephanie Thank said, you. all these textures are so inspiring. And uh, another comment uh, that she makes is, Thank you for sharing all the artwork. It's a delight. And I'm sure I won't be the only one that will experiment with Lunar Black later today. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love to inspire people. I love people to find their happy place in their studios to um, just explore and not expect these amazing, perfectly, you know, executed artworks and literally just enjoy the stage of painting, enjoy the stage of escaping in your creative mind. That's so important for your mental health as well as your emotional health um, to enjoy being yeah. a part of the studio work. We have one student saying hi, uh, she's Rosemary Hurley. Uh, she's, ah. <laughs> she's also from Canberra. Yes, she's one of my students. She's one of my Tuesday girls. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you there's a whole bunch of the others on the Facebook because they're normally on every week watching you guys anyway. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it's uh, it's so nice to share this journey with them they're always very excited when I um get to do these live things and they're, they're very encouraging of me which is lovely is Kimberly one of your students not Kimberly no no but she's asking is wax varnish different from cold wax cold wax polish is what I use okay Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I thought I might um, talk you through a little bit of the painting I started for uh, my sampling today. I thought I have to paint something, I have to prepare something. So I have been doing a series of workshops that are Klimt inspired artworks. And they are a multimedia um, work. They have a basis of, a, um, of an ink um, that is a water-soluble drawing ink, and that sets, and then you just can use the watercolour paper however you please, and the lovely black is nice and solid and slightly glossy. And painting with the watercolour paper um, with the black ink gives this really dynamic, dynamic difference of what you can achieve in, in the results. So, um, putting colour into these beautiful artworks. They're just nice and light to touch. They're a great friendly thing for a new artist to play with. And of course, very famous art. So you can 
find lots and lots of choices of images to um, play with your design. What I always do with students is to encourage them to be inspired by the art they see, but make it their own, make it different so that they can take ownership of their painting and not have it just as a copy of somebody else's work. Because as I said to them, if you copy it, you can do nothing with it, but tell people you learned from it. Um, if you make it your own, you actually have options and you can do things with your artwork. So the journey of all of this is so much fun. But when I first went on this morning, I, people were saying, what's that yellow? Is that um, masking fluid? What is that in your artwork? And I said, ah, it's a surprise and a secret, <laughs> but I will share it with you now. Um, a part of the foiling and gilding that I've been playing with, you can use um, a proper gilding gold, or you can use a product. Uh, get that on screen correctly. Uh, okay. So this is a foil that you can buy from your craft store, which is designed to be heat activated through these gold embossing card machines. These are for your scrapbooking kind of people. And this roll of foil is the, the gold is on the surface. But by using the gold size as a glue, you can actually activate the gold and actually put it into your artwork. So all of the yellow in my word is actually gold size. And I'm putting now metallic finish in my work. Yeah, okay. Quite a simple technique. It just is, I suppose, explorative and classic me likes to play with things that don't belong together and put them together anyway and give them a go and see how they turn out. And I find that they're really, really beautiful artworks and it's a different way of adding, the, adding that extra layer of multimedia into your, into your work. You can see how the gold is coming off the foil and now being stuck into the artwork. The gold is actually a resist. So if I was to paint watercolor on that now, the watercolor would resist. So I can put the gold foil on at any stage of the artwork. I don't have to wait till the end um, to put the gold foil on. So I can develop more of the color with the gold in the picture instead of relying on only the end stage, which I quite like. I'm not sure how many people like Clint work, but I found him to be very popular amongst people coming to do workshops. Let's see how it keeps adding. It's a, um, the glue, it's like a two, it's like a glue that stays sticky when it dries. So you're able to put in, um, like put it on the day before, come back to it. You don't have to work it straight away. It's not a glue that's going to set and you can't use later. It's literally best to be left and set properly. I'm going to get all the gold on this picture for you. In just a few moments. I will come back through and possibly add more gold later as I finish the picture. But at the moment, it's giving me what I need to continue the development of the image. You can see whether the gold size is going on, how it's coming off my oil gold. I think I gave the gold there last night. I did this about midnight last night. It's really neat. It's very, very exciting and cool. And it's so, I, I think it's just so fun to do. And it has so much success um, for people to play with their art, play with their watercolours. And many, many artists have, you know, really been through lots and lots and lots of different um, types of art styles. And they've got boxes and boxes full of all their craft gear and their this and their that. And I love to bring out products that people say, oh, I bought that when I did card making or I, I bought that when I was doing, you know, such and such a style of art. 
and I never thought to use it again. So I really love to mix up and encourage them to use those materials that they've invested in and been inspired by before, but bring it to their watercolour work. Because gosh, isn't watercolour amazing? You can do so much with it. I can keep going, there's probably more, but it gives you a reason to find um, something glossy and sparkly in your work. And then I can continue to add the beautiful luminescence and duochromes and things like that to the work as well. And I can have a very, very shiny artwork. Caroline, um, Buffy yes. would like to know, uh, she didn't catch the brand of the foil. Ah, this particular one, if I put it up there, it's called Go Press um, and Foil. It's a heat activated foil, but I have found that you do not need to use heat if you use a gold size. Uh -huh. and, the, and, and the- It's really the cheap. Glue? I'm sorry? And the glue? Uh, and the gold size is this particular brand that I use. Yeah. Is okay. Express It gold size. Super. But there's many brands around the world and any gold size will work. That's not a problem. And the exciting thing about the foils is it comes in a massive range of colours. So you can get blues and purples and reds and blacks and you know all sorts of colours. So you can actually really enhance your work in many ways by this product without going into the classic building gold. A lot of fun. So how are we going for time? Oh, we're doing fine. We're doing fine. Okay. Yep. So what else minutes. would you like me to show you? I can show you so much stuff. So, Thanks. Carolyn, how do you how do you use the sticks from a from a creative standpoint? Okay. So, if I go back onto my artwork, which is all the queens, this artwork. I loved the fact that I could draw into my work. You can see all the drawing marks as well as paint with my paintbrush. So the stick sort of really opened up this idea that I had almost like a watercolor crayon in my hand. And by, by dipping the stick, if I get a stick, dipping it into water, I can activate that stick. So I've just, um, I've just dipped the stick into the water and I can activate the stick on my palette. I can still have relatively clean hands even though I don't have clean hands. Um, and I can use a brush with it. But with a wet stick, I can then go in, I can actually, I can draw into this work. And I love the idea that you can have these lovely raw drawings kind of marks in your work. And if I put a mark down and go, oh, don't really like that. The bonus of the um, watercolor sticks is that it's pure pigment, it's pure watercolor. I can now activate that and actually put that into my work. So I don't have to worry if I don't like the stick mark, I can then turn it into a brush mark very quickly because it's so amazingly activates so quickly with the water. That's so, you guys come up with so many amazing cool things. We just um, are constantly inspired to keep creating because of these beautiful products. You're very kind. <laughs> Except we need stickers for our sticker boxes, <laughs> for our, <laughs> our cases. <laughs> I'm going to be on to you on that, that one. <laughs> I wrote that down. Oh, That's a clever yeah. Fantastic. So I can't recommend highly enough to, um, if you're at an art store that sells Daniel Smith um, products, is to get the full drop card sheets yeah. and activate the colours because you can't really tell from a tube what colour it's going to be. And if it's dry on your palette, it's very hard to see what colour it possibly is unless you know your colours really well. And having a dot card that has the dry mark as well as the wet, the watered down mark, you can then take it to your palette and go, ah, oh, that's the one I put there. And you know what color you've put down on your palette. So they're a great tool 
um, to help manage your colour in your studio. And they're also a great tool to help you have that wish list of what colour you're going to get next because there's so many amazing colours. Very good idea. Found yeah, it, it is. I found your recommendation of having a large uh, swatch that you've painted out of all of the pigments you own to be very helpful also because it's it's nice to see all of the pigments that are available in the small set but to see of the ones we already own what is the range and what is the flexibility and all the characteristics i find yes. that helpful yeah i think i think there's there's so much to be said about um swatching your, your colors uh, i know from the experience of all the students that i've encouraged to do that they have one taken a bit more ownership of what they have in the studio and what they're missing in their color ranges, but also to understand how the color really looks on a bigger piece of paper. Tiny little dots don't give a real a good indicator. And as I said to you, bringing a larger swatch as a group together to do a color selection for a painting, it's really helpful to have the bigger swatches to be able to do that sort of thing. Did you know you were... Caroline, these are wonderful ideas. I'm gonna have to watch this three or four times. I can't <laughs> keep up. You are so inspiring. I have such a crazy brain, don't I? It's constantly doing art, 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 art. <gasps> Your brain is beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. So, Carolyn, since you went over so many things, uh, you just a plethora of information, can we open it up to both uh, Zoom and Facebook for anybody that has questions sure. for Carolyn? She's showed quite a bit. Sure, that'd be great. So, if you're on Zoom, you can actually ask directly. Hello, Caroline. Hi. Um, when you prepare um, wood surfaces, yes. Be before you put any gesso on it, do you seal the wood? No, I go straight onto the wood surface. If anything, I give it a light sand to make sure it's got enough tooth to hold the ground and not peel at all. Now, would, would you have to be careful about what type of wood you use in that case? Because some no. some woods can see um, oils and things like that out if you don't seal them. Okay, so of course, if the oil in the wood is going to move through, the watercolour ground is technically porous, which is what it's designed for, for watercolourists. Perhaps a wood like that, you'd have to reconsider what you need to do. I've never used a wood like that, so I haven't had that problem. It's just being careful about what type of wood to use, isn't it, really? Yes. Yeah. I tend to use professional art product surfaces. Then I know it's been created and made for what I need it for. Yeah. If I've painted the watercolour ground on other surfaces, it's been for fun. It's been on ceramic, on perspex. Um, and on sort of safe surfaces that I haven't had to deal with any kind of leaching from other other um, internal products of, of the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. There are two questions, Caroline, from Facebook. One from mm -hmm. Patty. What's your favorite color combos? Oh, people ask me this all the time. Depends what I'm painting. I um, definitely am a blue girl, blue and ocean mm. colours and um, cobalt. They would be my have to own. I couldn't live without colours. But I paint in every colour. I paint according to what the artwork is about and the mood of the artwork. I paint um, according to my emotional interpretation of how I want to see the artwork um, come alive. So no particular favorite combinations I'm sorry to tell you and then from Christine I think she meant to ask about the the sealant or the pouring medium um basically asking whether it's a, is it the pouring medium 
it is a pouring medium. It is a polyurethane two-part pour medium. Thank you. From Nina, um, for the paint, for the curtains, which color, I know yes. you answered this, so she basically just asked what color um, paint was used for the curtains. Sure, let me, let me get that for you and I'll show you. So this has actually been painted on a gold um, watercolor ground that I've tinted with a little bit of acrylic paint. So I've used a blue acrylic and of course a blue will make, I might put it down on this surface and you can see it better. Um, the, I think you're gonna swap that over for me, Ethel. Yeah, fantastic. So I've used the watercolor ground and I've mixed it with a bit of a bit of a blue acrylic paint, which has given me these different tonal ranges of my watercolor ground surface. And I've used a really, you know, sort of a, a, a paintbrush with um, effects to leave a, a stipply sort of surface on the paper. And so the color on the background has been created by gold ground with a, a thallow blue mixed a tiny bit of fallow blue mixed into the gold ground which has given me this beautiful it's uh, like a gum leaf green color it's very pretty. Mm -hmm. more questions from um this is from julie how do you incorporate the ground into your painting do you brush it on or mix it with the paint or uh the ground needs to be put on the surface first and dried for 24 hours or longer. If you mix it with your watercolors, I think um, Nicholas does a little bit of this. You have to be very mindful of your brushes because it sets permanently in your brushes. You get lovely hard solid brushes. So I tend to always use <laughs> my um, cheaper go-to um, brushes for my for, for my brush on work for my watercolor ground and then let it set and then I just use my beautiful magical watercolor brushes to paint watercolor over the ground later. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, what percentage do you use the sticks in comparison to other you, I assume, uh, tubes? I probably use the sticks about maybe 30% of the time. Right. It comes down to where I am painting. The sticks are fantastic to take out with me because I can take a nice big selection of colours in a very small, compact, um, easy to find colour um, packaging as opposed to taking an enormous palette or tubes and tubes of paint which I've then got wet paint I've got to deal with to carry in the car and things like that so the sticks are you know like an instant dry uh, concept like using pans um, but in my studio I do a bit of stick work because I love to use the sticks for their technique and their effects but I mostly use tube paint because you, you do it looks like you do quite a lot of painting so <laughs> um, some large um, tubes would be the obvious answer wouldn't it I would say uh, look I think the size of the painting isn't affecting the choice of using sticks or, or, um, or palette paint as such I think it comes down to the versatility that the sticks can give me when I'm working up on an easel I can mm. take the one stick and not have to balance a, uh, a palette next to me and a water jar and a this and a that. I can just take the wet stick straight to the painting and draw with it. And then I can then put the stick down and wet, and wet up the area with my brush if I want to turn it into brush work or if I like the effect of the stick work, I can leave it that way. It's really um, a technical thing that I like the sticks as opposed to um, preferring them because of the way they, they manage or anything like that. I brought balance to the force with mine. <laughs> I've, uh, ah, yes. <laughs> I've, I've chopped them up and put it in some pans. Oh, cool. Perfect. 
Ian, just a quick check. We sent you a, a message, direct message. Uh, kindly, kindly check. It's in uh, Zoom message. Thanks, Ian. And there's a question from Judy. Have you added watercolor ground using a palette knife? Um, sorry, can you say that one again? Um, Judy asked whether you've tried um, adding watercolor ground onto your uh, watercolor paper on a surface, but using a palette knife. Yes, I have tried that. And yes, you can get effects with it because the watercolor ground will literally sit up and give you a textured surface. I think in my last demonstration with um, Daniel Smith in July last year, which is online, you can see a couple of surfaces that I did some of that work. I also used um, a little bit of impasto on some paper to make fat areas as such um, in the painting. And then I painted watercolor ground over the impasto, mm -hmm. which then gave me a, you know, a, a three dimensional aspect to some of the picture um for me to then watercolor on later carolyn where did you get those cool um boxes that you keep your tubes of paint in <laughs> oh aren't they great <laughs> they, they i have to show you the brand i just bought them all recently because i have this fantastic new setup let, let me show you i've got this new stack a new bookcase and I've got these wonderful little drawers Ooh. and look at all my paints in all the drawers. Oh, it's drawers. Yeah, they're drawers. Oh. And I got them from Amazon. Well, that's <laughs> and I'll tell you the brand, way. you all need to that's own nice. one of these. The brand, if I pull one out, oh, neat. they're Meaden, M-E-E-D-E-N. Thank yes. you, that is so cool. We need, we need to write that down. And you spell again. They were, they were only about $45 Australian. So they're really cheap. Wow. And they are six drawers per, per box. Thank and you. And look, I've got so many exciting things and I can keep it all organized. See, I've got pens and I've got pens. Look at this new pen. Look at this one. It's got lots and lots of bits on the top. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Well, that's a Japanese pen. So many things, so many beautiful things. Look, I can keep, I have a box full. Look at all the sticks. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so that's fantastic. And it fits the yes. tubes perfectly. Um, and it enables me just to take the drawer over to my table. And I, if I'm working on just a color group, um, for example, for today, because I wanted to show you things like the luminescence and the duochromes and things. I just took the two drawers that I have those ones in over to the table and I don't have to have um, misorganization, I suppose. I like it to be ordered. <laughs> that is such a helpful tip. Thank you so much. Yes. That's okay. They're great. Caroline? And the yeah, Buffy, the Buffy asks, in your rock paintings, what color are you using for your darkest value in the nooks and crannies of the stones? Um, okay, so I usually use a color um, that is complementary to the actual artwork and I mix it with neutral tint. So if the painting is predominantly blues, I'll mix um, uh, one of my favorite blues that's in the painting and I'll mix it with neutral tint and I'll deepen its value with neutral tint. Um, if it's something I want to contrast with and lighten or... Um, add an extra color to the riverbed. Um, I usually just choose a color that is, is um, looking at a value that will give me the shadows and darkness. I can show you some rock work that um, I became quite famous for these two pieces. Um, you can see the values aren't very dark at all. They're actually You can see that they're not, they're not overly dark. And the in-between is just a combination of the colors I was, I was using with the actual neutral tint to deepen it. So this one is purples or oh, there's glasses in the way, the glasses reflecting. 
So this is all browns and purples. So the neutral tint would have been mixed with the browns and with the purples to actually give me a, a colour. So when you're actually making a deeper tone of an artwork, using the colours that are already in the artwork helps the complementary things work together and not fight um, by adding new colours to the painting. So classic, classic work. Look, my cat's come to visit. Uh -oh. She's back. <laughs> I love Koa. That's Koa. That's yeah. Koa. <laughs> it's a bit crazy. I think everybody's gone to work at my house. They've all left me for the day. Oh, no, wow. they're all gone to work. <laughs> Caroline, could you answer a quick question about the foils that you use? Do you use sure. them with, ac with acrylic? And if you use it with acrylic, can you avoid the uh, the gold size? Uh, Will it stick on. to the acrylic? My head around that. No, the gold size is the glue that glues the actual foil to the painting. So then uh, like a matte medium or a gloss medium would not serve the same function? No, definitely not because gold size is a glue that you basically draw on or paint on where you want your gold foil to be. And it sets on the paper, adheres to the paper, but the surface remains sticky. And so when you put your foil mm. on that sticky surface, it holds the foil to the surface. So nothing else would do that. If you were to put foil on some, um, I don't know, a varnish <coughs> or something while it's wet, I think you'll just end up with a big mess. I don't oh, think you can you. manage it. Yes. Did you oh, see the view out of my studio this morning? That's it's foggy. Beautiful. This is a camera. Amazing. Is, yeah, what we can't see the mountains today. It's all foggy. This is what, winter what time in Canberra. Winter. What time is it? Um, this is my kind of painting. Five to eight. Five I'll take to you eight. out. I'll take you outside. Take, take you outside my house on my deck. This is where we um, enjoy breakfast on a nice spring day. Oh, and so beautiful. I. Can we join you for breakfast tomorrow? Oh, please. <laughs> that would be great. Come in. So me see. through. <laughs> yes, I can't we can wait organize, we can organize a, a bus that goes from. Uh, <laughs> that goes we have from beautiful Seattle, galleries from Spain and goes directly to Canberra. <laughs> we have beautiful galleries and we have beautiful restaurants and we have all sorts of wonderful things in my hometown. So we're not it's a big beautiful. town, we're only four, about 400,000 population, but big enough okay. to have all of the niceties of, you know, um, a great life as such. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yes. So, so what Caroline, a wonderful, I'll wonderful invitation to be with you today. <laughs> I wanted to thank you so much for doing the presentation today. I am, uh, let's see if I get back. Oh, there we go. I'm, I'm almost out of power. I wanted to thank you so much for taking the time today. I appreciate it. Um, your, your work is beautiful. And I love the way you're so passionate about talking about your students over and over and over. You must be just a wonderful teacher. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you it's so great. much it's for wonderful. All, all your tips and 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 tricks and yes. your secrets and really very, very in, extremely inspiring, inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. All right, thank Thanks. you everybody for, for joining us today. Again, thank you to Carolyn for taking the time and thanks for all the questions and look forward to seeing you all tomorrow, Friday. Carolyn, thank you very Yay. much. With Stella thank tomorrow. You so Thank you. With Stella tomorrow. Bye. Thank you with Stella tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Bye, Caroline. Bye. 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 Bye.